our perception of life is closely connected to our worldview. And then you say, man, that's deep. <laughs> my perception of life is connected to my worldview. Yeah, that, that seems about right. However, can you describe your worldview? Can you explain what your worldview is based on? What is your worldview? And if really our worldview is closely connected to our perception of life, to our experience of life, well, then it would be interesting to know what our worldview is. Because if we are not happy with our perception of life, if we wish to improve our perception of life, our life experience, well, worldview would be a really good place to look. If we can change our worldview, we can change our perception of life. And I will spare you the excruciating pain of trying to define your worldview. <laughs> because our worldview is, let me quote the dictionary here, basic assumptions or concepts we have of the world. Basic assumptions. We assume things to be in a certain way. And the funny thing about assumption is you never ever question it. You don't ever question your assumptions, you just assume they are true. And our worldview today is collectively is based on science, but it wasn't always like that. For thousands of years, our worldview was connected to some kind of divinity, God or gods. So, who created the universe? Who created me? Why am I here? Uh, what's my mission? What's my purpose? How long this all is going to last? How it's going to end? And who's going to clean up afterwards? <laughs> Answer was always one and the same. It was God or gods. In some traditions, there were thousands of gods, and sometimes even with different departments, like God of War and God of Wisdom and God of uh, Rain and so on. So, whatever, it, maybe it, it was one almighty, all-powerful God, creator of the universe, who created me in his own image, and maybe it was thousands of them. Doesn't matter. Our existence and this world and the universe in general was uh, some kind of uh, God's will. And uh, things started to change uh, in the Middle Ages. And the pivotal point in that transition from God worldview to scientific worldview that we share today was in the year 1687 when a guy called Sir Isaac Newton wrote a pivotal book. It was written in Latin and it's called Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica or Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. In this book, Sir Isaac Newton gave us three basic laws of mechanics, of classical physics, as we call it, the Newtonian physics. And for the first time ever, someone was talking about speed and mass and force and counterforce and acceleration and gravity. We finally understood the nature of gravity, what gravity is and why Moon can uh, circle around Earth, never crashing down. How this universe works, we were finally able to calculate the trajectories of the planets and comets and asteroids and meteors and so on. And it was groundbreaking. It was really groundbreaking. Our classical physics today still relies on his principles, principles that he laid out for us. And, but the philosophical implications of that work were even more important than just you know, mathematical 
or physical. Because what Isaac Newton proposed was that there is a certain philosophy in nature, natural philosophy, that is based on principles of mathematical nature. So, there are mathematical principles, principles that can be calculated and predicted with precision, that govern the nature and natural philosophy. So, for the first time ever, our universe, world around us, became predictable because we can calculate it and it is objective. So, for example, if I drop this pen, it's going to fall down each and every time. It's going to fall down and it is going to take this pen maybe two seconds, let's say, to reach the floor. It doesn't matter who is doing the experiment. When are you doing the experiment? Are you watching that experiment or not? Are you doing it today or tomorrow? It's going to be the same for everybody each time you do that experiment. So, for the first time ever, universe was not some kind of whim of some higher being or higher force or God or gods or spirit, but it is predictable. And since it is much, much, much more useful to calculate or predict that this weekend is going to be rain, for example, then just to pray to God of rain, to not to jump on the cloud hitting with his hammer clouds and making, <laughs> making it rain for all of us, this worldview slowly, bit by bit, started to become, well, more important. Or at least it penetrated our collective consciousness. So, maybe God really created the universe. And maybe really God created me in his own image. And uh, maybe all that I can see is some kind of God's plan. Like we can put it that way. However, once God created all of that, Maybe he just left, because he is not going to intervene in my experiment of dropping pen. Never, ever, ever. My experiment of uh, measuring how long does it take for pen to reach the floor if I drop it, it's going to be the same every time, and it doesn't depend on some God's will. So, maybe God created all that, but he left us with rules, with certain principles of mathematical nature that are predictable and that can be calculated. And that was a huge, huge step in our collective consciousness, because from this year forward, for the next 200 and 250 years or something like that, it was great time for science. It was really good to be <laughs> a scientist during the 17, 18, and 19th century. Because we learned a lot about optics, thanks to Sir Isaac Newton again, uh, chemistry, uh, genetics, uh, thermodynamics, uh, electricity, electromagnetism, Based on this physics, we started building machines. And that's a huge step. Huge step. Because for the first time ever, it wasn't always uh, uh, human muscles and force, or animals, for example, in agriculture, uh, needed for a, a lot of things. We, we finally had steam engine. We were building uh, trains and ships. And modern ships based on steam engine, they did not rely on, uh, you know, row, row, row your boat. <laughs> so, it was great. And of course, product productivity uh, in general started to climb.
we were able to produce more, more food, more clothes, more goods, because we finally understood how the natural philosophy works. We found out about principles that govern natural philosophy or nature or world where we live in. And they are objective, they are the same for everyone, and they are, for, and they are same for everyone each time you do the experiment or you build machine in a certain way. And it was a huge, huge achievement. So much so that in the year 1905, I'm sorry, 1903, 1903, one of the leading physicists in the world, called Albert Abraham Michelson, said this. The more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered. And these are now so firmly established that the possibility of their even being supplanted in consequence of new discoveries is exceedingly remote. Our future discoveries must be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. What Mr. Mickelson is saying is We know it all we know it all, we know it all, and we know it now. <laughs> so, all the most uh, important fundamental laws of the nature, we already know. And it is uh, highly impos improbable, impossible, that we are ever going to find different laws. Because this is it. And yeah, maybe we can measure it a little bit better, but, you know, who cares, <laughs> really. So, why are we talking about this? Because our collective and individual worldview today is based on this science. It is science founded in 1687, and by the year 1903 we knew all of it. And uh, it views or depicts the universe as a giant machine. And it is on, there is only one reality, objective reality, only one version of reality that is valid for everyone. And if I am saying that this wall is yellow and all of you are saying that it is white, then I'm wrong, because objectively it is white. There is only one version of reality that works for everyone. Nature, or universe, is a mechanism. It is governed by mathematical principles that are deterministic, that are predictable, and that can be calculated in advance. Every action has equal and opposite reaction, meaning there is a certain linearity or of events. So my action created, creates some consequence, and that consequence is a source of another action that creates another consequence. There's causality of events. Events are going in a linear fashion. And we are just a billiard balls in a huge universe that's just like a huge billiard table. We are bumping into each other. Uh, and there is a certain scarcity of resources. We are fighting for resources, fighting each other. And life happens to us. Because best case scenario, and this is really best case scenario, that mechanism that we, that we are calling universe is not that much interested in us. Not much. <laughs> but best case scenario, it is neutral. It doesn't care about us. Worst case scenario, universe is somehow against us. 
because it really doesn't care what we need, it really doesn't care what we want, we need to fight our way through it by moving other billiard balls that are equally separate from the whole picture sitting <laughs> in a huge billiard table. So, in a way, we are isolated. We are victims of that mechanical thing that we call universe, and we are unable to control our destiny. And that's a bit scary. You know, it creates a certain stress because uh, fear, stress, because it triggers our fight or flight mode. So, in a, in, when you are under stress, when you are in a fearful scenario, when you, in a reality that you perceive as unfriendly for you, you always react with fight or flight. In this case, we, we don't have ability to flight or to run away. How can you run away from the universe? So we are fighting it. And we are fighting each other and we are fighting the universe, and we are fighting nature, and we are cruel to animals, we are using them, we are fighting the animals too, we are even fighting the extraterrestrials. I mean, just take a look at this interesting thing. Uh, of course, there are hundreds of thousands of science fiction movies, and in most of them, not all, but most of them, these extraterrestrials are coming from different planet or from different galaxy. Why? To fight us, to conquer us, to kill us all. I mean, really? Why? <laughs> is, is that something that sounds uh, plausible to you? That someone will come from another galaxy to kill us because why? Because he wants they want our oil, what? They want our water, like there is no water in the universe. <laughs> like we, oh, we are so special. And we are a threat to them. And equally, when we uh, go into our spaceships and we meet all those Vulcans and Romulans and Klingons, we usually fight them one way or the other to somehow, what? Survive, really? Really? Is that all there is? Do we really need to kill other intelligent species because, just because they are there? Or do, do we really have a basis for assumption that once we meet another intelligent species, they will try to kill us? Why? However, we are living in constant fear because it is, a, it is a constant fear reinforcing itself. We need to fight the universe, we need to fight nature, we need to fight each other over resources that are scarce. We are even fighting the imaginary, <laughs> imaginary enemies like extraterrestrials. And of course, that's why we have all those terrorism and we are always scared because of this and because of that. I mean, just, just take a look at your news. Medicine. Now that's an interesting topic. Because we are looking outside and we are perceiving the world as unfriendly, and we are perceiving it as a mechanical mechanism, machine, we are looking at our body in the same way. We are perceiving, we are looking our bodies and our health in terms of mechanics. And sometimes that's quite all right. If you injure yourself, if you cut yourself, if you really damage your biochemical machine that we call the body, somehow, Go to the nearest hospital, because they know how to fix you up. And they will do it perfectly, in a record time. You really shouldn't be worried, because we are great at that. However, when we are talking about consciousness, for example, that's a different picture. We 
the, we believe, we assume, we assume that consciousness is byproduct of our brain complexity. And that's just an assumption. There is no one shred of evidence for it. But, however, you will hear, for example, in hospital, the patient has regained consciousness. Somehow, your brain finally started working properly created consciousness. We assume that consciousness is byproduct of our brain complexity, or at least our mind creates consciousness. This gray field <laughs> inside brain, it creates consciousness. Also, we have very, very hard time explaining other phenomena in medicine, like placebo effect, for example. We treat placebo effects just like any other statistical anomaly. So, for example, someone has some kind of sickness and you tell him that you will give him medicine, but you are just giving him whatever water with some sugar and electrolytes. Nothing. Nothing that would improve his uh, health. However, a lot of patients receiving placebo for complicated diseases get better. They get better. So, what we are saying on that fact, yeah, <laughs> it's just, you know, luck. So, we don't understand placebo effect. Actually, we are fighting placebo effect because placebo cannot be bottled and sold in a pharmacies. <laughs> so, we have no use for that. We are treating our body, we are looking at our body as a machine. As a biochemical machine, but nevertheless, machine. And to, patch, to, to, to finish this uh, overview, we are looking at the universe as a deterministic machine. However, we believe that we are here by accident. So, nothing in the universe is accident. There is cause and effect, causality, linearity of, of events. But we are. Because we are just a product of uh, millions and millions, even billions of years of DNA uh, mixing and uh, exchanging and making errors that somehow prove to be beneficial. So, we are here, by Darwin theory, by accident. Long, 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 long line of accidents. And good accident gets promoted, bad accident dies, and however, we are here by accident in a universe that's fully deterministic and doesn't make anything by accident, exclusively by force and counterforce and so on. Now, that's really, really confusing. So, we are forced to play this game of life. And once, when we are, once we are born, we don't get a rule book with our life. However, society will gladly give a rule book to you. So, you should go to kindergarten, then you should go to school at the age of six or seven. Then you should go to the high school, then you should go to university, get a job, uh, marry, have children, family. So, you know, life is kind of programmed and society gives you rule book what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and even tests, it gives you a little tests to see if you are advancing <laughs> properly <laughs> in all that. And uh, we live by the clock. You know, it is another mechanical or electronic device that's governing our life. You know, 500 years ago, when we had God worldview, we were, woke up with sun, we went to bed 
at night and uh, you eat when you're hungry, you drink <laughs> when you're thirsty, but today you eat when you have a lunch break. And that's maybe at noon, that's maybe at 2 p.m. or whatever. However, you don't eat when you're hungry. You eat when they allow you, when society allows you to eat, when it's your lunch break. And you don't get to stay in bed for half an hour more because, because you, you, you would like to sleep, sleep some more. No, 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 no. Your job starts at 8 or 9 sharp. And so you get up, you eat because you have to eat because it's time for eating your breakfast. You can't eat your breakfast two hours later. So you go out, you eat your breakfast, you sit in your car and you drive on the road. So you, you don't even have the uh, freedom to go wherever you wish. You need to follow the road. And then you get to your job and then you have a lunch break and you don't get to go home before 5 p.m. So we are living a life that's also mechanical. In the universe that's mechanical. Your body is mechanical. <laughs> Everything is mechanical. Everything is deterministic. There is linearity of events. Everything is objective. There is only one version of reality. That is our collective worldview and, of course, our individual worldview for the most part. And it would be great if it, if it were all there is. Is that really all there is? It turns out it's not. And uh, man who showed us that it is not all there is and things are just a little bit more complicated or different than this mathematical, mechanical picture was anonymous clerk from the Swiss Patent Office called Albert Einstein. In the year 1905, roughly, Albert Einstein stepped forward and broke all these principles. In fact, he showed us that this is just one case, one special case. However, the universe is much more interesting than just this version of reality. So, in 1905, Albert Einstein brought us relativity. We are not going to go deep into relativity, it's a big subject. Uh, we're just going to make a few remarks. There is general relativity, there is special relativity, I'm not going too much into details. However, what Albert Einstein showed us is that things we assumed to be 100% objective. For example, time and distance are not so objective at all, at all. Let me give you an example. Let's say that here in the parking lot I have a spaceship that's able to go about 99% of speed of light. So speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, it's quite fast. But it's measurable, it's not incredibly fast. For example, it takes about eight and a half minutes for light to reach, to come from Sun to Earth. So it's a measurable. So if you have a spaceship that is moving 99% of the speed of light, you get really interesting effects. For example, I go into the spaceship and I tell you, just wait for me here for a few minutes. I'll make one round trip around Venus or whatever, and I'll be back in exactly one minute. So we can synchronize our watches 
start our stopwatches. Time now, click. I go into my spaceship and I accelerate to 99% speed of flight. I make a turn. I'm looking at my watch and counting 59 seconds, 58 seconds, 57, 59, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. After exactly one minute, I park here and I come back into this room. And you say, well, that was seven minutes. Uh, no, it was one minute. Look, I have a watch. My watch is saying that this round trip was one minute long. You say, no, 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 it was seven minutes. We, we also have <laughs> watches, so you can't cheat. It was seven minutes. And we are both, really, both assumptions, both measurements are precisely true. Because when you are moving at the 99% of the speed of light, time for you, objectively, passes seven times slower. Seven times slower. So, what was one minute for me, it was seven minutes for you. Objectively, you have your watches, I have my watch, nobody cheated. But when you are approaching the speed of light, time, it's called time dilation. And now you can say time stretches or time shrinks, it depends from which side you are measuring. However, one minute for me, moving at the 99% of the speed of light, is seven minutes for you, objectively. And the same effect goes with the distance. So, if, for example, my spaceship is seven meters long, once I reach 99% of the speed of light, for you, watching me through the telescope, my spaceship is only one meter. For me, sitting inside the spaceship, it's seven meters, of course. Nothing changed for me. For me, everything is the same. So, my watch is going second by second. It's not that my second is seven times longer, so one, two. It's one, two, three. For you, it's seven times longer, time and distance, seven times shorter. And as you approach the speed of light more and more, like 99.99%, that effect gets even more measurable and more absurd. <laughs> so, for example, if you are moving at 99.9999% of the speed of light, that effect is roughly 707 times. What is one minute for me is one 707 minutes for you. So, I'll leave you here with a complete table calculation. As you can see, uh, that effect is not that uh, strong, not that noticeable, uh, when uh, speeds are closer to these speeds that we have here you know, <clears throat> about 1000 kilometers an hour, it's a speed of a commercial jet flying from Europe to the United States, for example. So, in, at th that speed, or at speed at which we are walking and we are driving our cars, it is barely, barely, barely measurable. You really need to have very, very, very precise equipment to measure that effect. However, when you're approaching speed of light, it really, really gets interesting. The second thing that Albert Einstein gave us was his famous equation E equals mc square. Maybe you heard about that formula. It's beautiful, it's elegant, fits on a t-shirt, makes you look really smart. However, do you know what that really means? Okay. E is energy. M is mass. 
and C is speed of light. Now, this is a constant. It is 300,000 kilometers per second. So, that part of formula C squared, this, this number squared, uh, tells us how much energy you get from one kilo of mass. So, energy equals mass times C squared. This is a constant. So, we can just, for a few minutes, ignore it. And what we are left with is E equals M, or mass is energy. Mass is energy. Mass is energy. Everything you see, everything that you can touch, is energy. And universe is one giant energy field. There is nothing in the universe except energy. All you see is energy. And please don't believe me. This is what one of the greatest scientist mind of the history, Max Planck. Max Planck was one of the greatest physicists of all times. And this is what he said some round in 1944. As a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you, as a result of my research about the atoms, this much. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particles of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of conscience and intelligent spirit. This spirit is the matrix of all matter. So, Max Planck, one of the greatest physicists of all time, first gives us introduction, saying that he devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter. He knows that what he is about to tell us is so impossible, so improbable, so beyond our regular, normal, everyday comprehension of life and universe in general. So, he needs to emphasize, he feels the need to emphasize that he devoted his life to the most clear-headed science of all, the study of matter. And then he goes and says, there is no matter as such. All matter is energy condensed or slowed in a slow vibration. And that slow vibration gives that matter certain solidity. You can touch the walls and each other and uh, this whiteboard and pen and whatever, because that energy is condensed to a slow vibration. Or in his words, for, there is a force which brings the particles of an atom to vibration and hold this most minute solar system of the atom together. And now we are coming to the second point that's even more important. He says that there is a force that holds the atom together and we must assume that behind this force there is conscience and intelligent spirits. There is conscience and intelligent spirit. You can call it soul, you can call it consciousness, conscience spirit. However, consciousness is not byproduct of our brain complexity. Consciousness 
is inherent to all matter, even tiny, small, tiny atom is hold, hold, that, that force that holds it together is a conscious and intelligent. Each and every atom has a certain consciousness included or there wouldn't be matter. Matter is byproduct of consciousness. And that is one of the one answer to one of the greatest questions that our modern science has. And it's called where does life or where does consciousness come from? Let's start with life. So, for example, let's take one single cell bacteria, one of the simplest life forms that you can possibly imagine. Single cell bacteria. That bacteria is made up, it contains some water molecules, some carbon, uh, nitrogen, um, oxygen, and so on. Is the water molecule conscious? No. Is it alive? Well, no. Okay. How about carbon? Is carbon alive? Is it conscious? I mean, you know what carbon is. Uh, carbon is both coal, for example, and a diamond. Is diamond conscious? No, it's not. How about a molecule of nitrogen? How about uh, hydrogen? How about oxygen? Are these molecules alive? Are they conscious? Well, I believe you will say no. However, you put them together and by some miracle it certainly becomes alive. I mean, bacteria, okay, maybe it, ha it doesn't have consciousness as complex and rich as our consciousness is. However, bacteria eats, uh, searches for food, uh, you know, it has a tendency to move away from, for example, antibiotic, for poisons. Bacteria considers antibiotic a poison, of course. So, it has a tendency to move away from antibiotic and it has a tendency to move forward or towards the food. So, it has some tiny intelligence or consciousness and it definitely is alive because it uh, reproduces, for example. So, when does non-conscious, non-living ingredients become conscious and alive? And, okay, now you can say uh, bacteria is not conscious. That, that's another interesting point. We, we now we, we know for certain that it is alive. Is it conscious? Let's go from another direction. We are conscious, right? So, human race is conscious. Monkeys are also conscious, right? Dolphins are also conscious. How about dogs and cats? Maybe they are not self-conscious. Maybe your cat is not aware of being aware. However, it is aware. So, there is cat consciousness. Your cat is conscious. Your dog is conscious. Horse. So, we are moving backwards through the uh, evolutionary scale. So, how about alligator? Is an alligator conscious? It is far, far, far removed from our evolutionary scale, so it is much, much, much simpler organism. However, it is conscious. Right? Okay, let's find the point where organisms become less conscious. So, 
Alligator, okay. How about insects? Are insects conscious? Yes, they are. How about jellyfish? You see, we assumed that our consciousness comes from our brain complexity. And that means our central nervous system. Our central nervous system is made from billions and billions of uh, cells of uh, neurons. They are called neurons. Huh? So, we have billions of neurons somehow reprogramming themselves and finding a better pathways. We don't really understand how, how that works, but nevertheless, we have billions of neurons and so uh, monkeys have a bit less and uh, alligator also has a certain nervous system, but it is even much more simple. However, jellyfish does not have a single neuron. It does not have a central nervous system. How do you feel about taking jellyfish and throwing it in the fire? Is it easier to throw a jellyfish in a fire than to plug out your computer? Let's say that your printer or your computer started doing printing some junk pages and you don't want that. <laughs> what do you do? You just switch off the printer. You kill the printer. I mean, you turned off its consciousness if, it, if there is such thing. Of course, printer is not conscious. It is just a machine. Jellyfish doesn't have a central nervous system. Is it just a machine? Is it really just a machine? You feel like there is something alive. You, you don't feel good killing jellyfish. You don't feel anything killing printer or computer or dishwasher. You can hit it with a hammer and sure, it's a device that's useful, so you're not going to do that. <laughs> but if you really need to, you don't have any kind of complaint from your, from your consciousness, from your consciousness. Killing jellyfish, you do. You feel that something is inside. So, consciousness does not come from the central nervous system. Max Planck told us where consciousness comes from. Consciousness is what makes matter possible. Behind any atom, there is conscience and intelligent spirit. Without that conscience and intelligent spirit, there wouldn't be matter at all. So, we are sitting in a huge field of energy. And you see, that's not like being a billiard ball on a billiard table, because energy doesn't have that strict boundaries like matter. For example, this pen has a strict boundaries. I can say, yeah, okay, here I have a pen, here I don't. There is no pen here. There is pen here, there is no pen here. When you have energy, for example, your Wi-Fi router, it emits energy, information, but energy. Sure, signal is better when you come closer, and it's a bit uh, weaker when you move three feet from it. However, you can feel that, that that energy that router emits doesn't exactly has a point with the strict border, you know, here you have a router signal and here you don't. Because here there is a border between having a signal and not having a signal. If we are energy, if all matter is energy and we are energy field too, we don't exactly have borders. You have uh, 200 meters from me, energy that my body is emitting gets very, 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 very weak. So you can say, like that, but 
we are all immersed in a giant soup of energy. And the only reason why we feel solid and why this room feels solid is because there is some conscious and intelligent spirit sitting behind it that creates certain solidity. And if you have trouble wrapping your mind around this, don't worry, because Max Planck himself said something that's very funny. And he said, science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> so Max Planck understood there is no way you can teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> There is no way that you can make old scientists, old physicists, accept these breakthrough achievements, that there is no matter as such. And behind each and every atom, there is a conscious and intelligent spirit. There is consciousness behind everything. Actually, there is nothing but consciousness in the universe. And so he said that science advances one funeral at a time, because new guys, new people are, get acquainted with new theories and they accept it. And you just cannot explain to the physicist that has a dissertation based on this physics and has a tenure in a prestige university and he is teaching for 20, 30 or 50 years this kind of physics, now you, you will somehow make him see the light. Oh no, I was wrong all along. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I should change everything about it. No, you can't. So science advances one funeral at a time. And this is what universe really looks like. This is a physics that universe is really based on. Sure, there is what we can call a mechanical world that's governed by these principles. And it's great, because this physics allows us to have machines and we are able to build huge buildings, uh, skyscrapers for more than 500 meters high that are not going to break down with the first earthquake because we know how to calculate the amount of steel and glass and uh, cement and concrete uh, in a way that it will be stable. And this is great if we are talking about mechanical universe, but if we are talking about the nature of reality, what that universe is made from, it's made of energy and nothing but energy. And this point of view leads us to a completely new direction. And that direction is also nothing new. Let me just quote one of the greatest physicists and inventors that the world ever had. His name was Nikola Tesla. And yes, <laughs> that's how his name is properly pronounced, or at least that's how he would pronounce his name. And you can trust me on that because he was our countryman here. He was born maybe 200 kilometers um, from this place we are sitting in here. And he says, The day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. We should study non-physical phenomena. So this is a study of physical phenomena. And this worldview is based on matter. This worldview is based on energy. It is two completely different pictures. And Nikola Tesla says that we should focus on this side of our whiteboard. <laughs> we should explore non-physical phenomena. And that changes P 
picture completely. I will give you just one small example and we are going to discuss it in much more detail later, but just as a hint, just to see where this is all going. So there is an age-old question. Do we have a soul? And where is it? And, but do we have a soul? Actually, you are a soul. What you have is a body. Your body is contained inside your soul. There is an intelligent conscious spirit that creates your body. It's not that your body as a machine, mechanical or biochemical, made out of matter, creates consciousness. It's consciousness that creates your body. You are, you don't have a soul. You are a soul and you have a body. These are two completely different worldviews. However, we all collectively and most, most, most of us individually focus on matter instead on energy. Okay, so let's sum it up. Reality, in all paradigm, reality is objective. There is only one reality, it's the same for everybody. In this new paradigm, reality is subjective. Because, as Einstein showed us, your experience of a second of time and space, of a meter of distance, greatly depends on your point of reference on your on speed in which you are moving. It is called frame of reference. Einstein called it frame of reference. So inside your frame of reference, everything is normal. <laughs> one second is one second for you and for me and for everyone who is sitting inside my spaceship. However, for you who are waiting for us, it is 70 times longer or shorter, depends on from which side you're looking on, if you're moving at the speed of 99.99999% speed of light. So there is no objective reality. Reality is strictly subjective. And you can relate to this fact from an everyday perspective easily. For example, maybe you came here with a friend. And now you're discussing, is this a good or bad lecture? Is it interesting? Is it believable? And you say, oh my God, it's great. Uh, I can't believe it's a whole new world. This is the best thing I've ever heard for a long time. And your friend said, yeah, it's kind of boring. Uh, it's not plausible. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it doesn't relate to me. I don't resonate with this new point of view. Now. Is it objectively a good lecture or is it objectively a bad lecture? There is no such thing. Objectively, it's good for you and it's bad for your friend. There is no objective reality. Okay. How about what we are? From this point of view, we are mechanisms. From this point of view, we are organisms. And being a mechanism and being an organism is quite different. For example, how do you get a mechanism? Mechanism is created by putting pieces together. For example, your car is a mechanism. How it was created? It was created because someone in some car manufacturer created hundreds of parts and then assembled them together. Mechanical machines, mechanisms, are created from the outside in 
by putting separate pieces together. Organism grows from the inside out, like a tree or like you. How did you become? How, how did you come here? It was first, you know, fertilized egg and um, uh, sperm and and then you grew in your mother's belly and then you get born and then you continue to grow from the inside in out from the inside out not from the outside in and obviously we are organisms and if you believe a big bang theory universe is an organism too because there was a singularity that exploded from the inside out, creating everything. If God created the universe, like the Bible says, for example, first day God created light, and then he created land, and then he created uh, water and animals and uh, humans, it was put together. It was this concept. It was mechanism. However, if the universe just exploded in some gi gigantic space anomaly or whatever, <laughs> then it is an organism and it's based on energy. Okay? Consciousness is not a byproduct of uh, your brain complexity. It is mechanical point of view. So, for example, you have a computer from 30 years ago and you have a modern computer and certainly modern computer is much better. It looks in more intelligent than computer from 30 years ago. Because we advanced that mechanism, we created that mechanism better. And if we are really mechanisms, yeah, then by adding complexity to our computer or to our body or to our central nervous system or to our brain, you get more and more complicated machine that at one point, certain point, becomes conscious. This is mechanical point of view. But if consciousness is inherent in every atom, then consciousness just is. Consciousness creates everything. And consciousness is just inherent. By creating more complex organisms, you maybe you get more and more uh, of consciousness. The consciousness gets more complex. But if Consciousness is force that holds each and every atom together. Then even a stone has some consciousness. And certainly that consciousness is not as complex as ours, if you take one stone. But what about huge stone? Let's talk about planet. Our planet's conscience. And the answer is yes. Planet is conscious. Our sun is conscious on some level. So consciousness is not byproduct of a brain complexity. Consciousness is inherent. When we want to improve our life, here we are fo focusing on circumstances. And then we say, we want a bigger house, I want a better car, I want more love in my life, bigger family, more friends. That's focusing on circumstances. But there is a better way of doing it, and that's, that's focusing on experience, on your perception of life. And in the beginning we said, our perception of life is closely connected to our worldview. Now, please choose. You have two competing worldviews. So this is 
old worldview and this is new worldview. Whatever you choose, it will greatly influence your perception of life. It will greatly influ influence your life experience, your experiences. Of course, there, <laughs> there is no other experience than life experience, <laughs> but you see, you understand what I mean. So, what we are focusing on is how to improve experience of life. And as we will see during this course, our life experience, our experiences, quality of our experiences have nothing to do with circumstances. This is old paradigm. Okay. This part deals with matter. And this part, this worldview, deals with energy. So, if you are going to explore the universe and trying to understand the secrets, you can focus on physical phenomena or non-physical phenomena. When you are focusing on physical phenomena, you explore and deal with mass weight, force, counterforce, distance, speed, you know, materialistic uh, parameters. When you are focusing on energy, you measure frequency, vibration, amplitude, completely different set of parameters. Information, resonance, energy fields. So, Nikola Tesla gave us a hint. He said, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make huge advances in record time. So, what is your body? Is it matter or is it energy? How should we proceed with exploring our medicine? By studying molecules and interactions between matter or by exploring energy, information, resonance, vibration and so on and so on. Nikola Tesla and Max Planck and Albert Einstein and many other scientists that we know and that we are calling geniuses suggested that we focus on this side, not on this side. But let me put it this way. What exactly do you want from your life. Can you pinpoint one thing, one concept that you would like to have more of? Take your time, take your time, don't rush it. Find one thing. What do you want more in your life? Money. Thank you. Money. Always a popular choice. What else? Love. Love is a romantic love. Okay, family. Okay, family. So obviously, family is also uh, love, <laughs> right? It's just a different kind. Okay, what else? Excitement. Abundance. <laughs> Oh, abundance. Success. Thank you. Uh, can I write accomplishment? Uh, yeah, accomplishment. Uh, accomplishment. What else? We want more money, we want more love, we want family, excitement, purpose. Thank you. Purpose. 
What else? How about peace? You know, deep inner peace. Okay. What else? This is discovers most. Okay. Let's see. First, we are going to eliminate abundance <laughs> because it doesn't mean anything. Abundance of what? You don't want abundance of pain <laughs> or suffering or stress. You want abundance of good things. So, okay. We want we want abundance say that we want a lot of other things. Uh, what is success? What exactly is success? Success for you can be having a big family, for someone else be having a lot of money, for someone else being happy. Thank you. That's answer to all our questions. Actually, we just want to be happy. All these things are just means to an end. Why won't you? Why do you want love or family or excitement? Because it will lift you up. Because you want love. Because family is also love. Excitement is. What are all these things? What is peace? What is love? Family? Emotions. Thank you. These are all. E motions. E motion, energy in motion. Love is energy. Uh, peace is energy. It's certain quality of energy. Uh, what else? Accomplishment. Accomplishment. Why do you want accomplishment? Because you want to find your purpose, because you want to find that inner peace. And by doing what you are meant to do, you will also find some excitement. And you will fall in love with your life. I know this love is for in a romantic context, but nevertheless, love is behind it. So what we want is a happiness. What we want is, that's funny, nobody ever uh, remembers this one and it is crucial. Nobody remembers it because it is so fundamental that we don't even think about it. And it is freedom. Freedom, my favorite F word. Freedom, we want to be happy, we want to be free, we want to have peace and purpose and accomplishment and excitement and love. And all of these are emotions, energy in motion. It is a quality of energy, it is a quality of consciousness. It is energy. It is on this side of our whiteboard, not on that side. Except maybe for money. Money. So, <laughs> money is <coughs> in a domain of matter because you can have, you know, uh, a lot of money, usually, uh, how you would draw it, uh, like a huge pile of banknotes or bills. Okay. However, is money really in the matter of? Matter. <laughs> Is it in the domain of matter? Does it matter? <laughs> Money actually is not matter. Money is information. Maybe 2000 years ago, when money was gold or silver, Maybe we could talk about that. You know, I want more money, I want a bigger, bigger pile of gold. Today, your money is just a number in someone else's computer. It's on your bank account. If I want to give you 100 euros, I will deduct it from my bank account and add it to yours. So, one piece of information 
gets smaller. That's my bank account before and after <laughs> the transaction. And your bank account got from smaller to bigger. It's just a transfer of information. Only small, small percentage of money in the world, less than 10%, actually less than 5%, depending on uh, what you will count. There are certain bonds and... Uh, but never mind. It's only small percentage of money in the world today exists in a physical form, as a coin, as a, a banknote. Money is actually information. All we want is to be happy, to be free. Uh, we want love. Love is a certain quality of emotion, of energy field that our body interprets as emotion. Peace, purpose, accomplishment, it is all just quality of energy that our body will interpret as emotion. So, we are going to continue our course by focusing on energy. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. And that's exactly what are we going to do from this point forward.